chapter 4, and if you're going to use the Bible that's in the pews, that's on page 174. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now before we read, just a comment uh, regarding verse 19, because I'm going, to, I'm going to read from the Good News Bible, because that's the one that's in the pews there, but I'm going to switch to the New International for verse 19 to tell you why. Verse 19 in the Good News Bible seems to suggest that God has given the sun, the moon and the stars for other peoples to worship. As if that's a perfectly good and right thing and what God intended to do. Now I may have misread or misunderstood and if I have, forgive me. But it's important in the context of Deuteronomy 4 the sun, the moon, the stars are all gifts from God. Not given to us to worship, we're to benefit from them, to be blessed by them, but to give to God the glory as the creator of them. So that's why at verse 19, I shall try and skip across to the New International Version here. But we're going to read together Deuteronomy 4 and beginning at verse 15. Well, when the Lord spoke to you from the fire on Mount Sinai, you did not see any form. For your own good then, make certain that you do not sin by making for yourselves an idol in any form at all. Whether man or woman, animal or bird, reptile or fish. Do not be tempted to worship and serve what you see in the sky. The sun, the moon and the stars. All the heavenly host. Do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshipping things that the Lord your God has given to all the nations under earth. But you are the people he rescued from Egypt, that blazing furnace. He brought you out to make you his own people as you are today. Because of you, the Lord your God was angry with me and solemnly declared that I would not cross the river Jordan to enter the fertile land which he is giving to you. I will die in this land and never cross the river. But you are about to go across and occupy that fertile land. Be certain that you do not forget the covenant that the Lord your God made with you. Obey his command, not to make yourselves any kind of idol, because the Lord your God is a flaming fire. He tolerates no rivals. Even when you have been in the land a long time, you have children and grandchildren, do not sin by making for yourselves an idol in any form at all. This is evil in the Lord's sight, and it will make him angry. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that if you disobey me, you will soon disappear from the land. You will not live very long in the land across the Jordan that you are about to occupy. You will be completely destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among other nations where only a few of you will survive. And there you will serve gods made by human hands, Gods of wood and stone. Gods that cannot see or hear, eat or smell. There you will look for the Lord your God. And if you search for him with all your heart, you will find him. When you're in trouble and all those things happen to you, then you will finally turn to the Lord and obey him. He is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you, and he will not forget the covenant that he himself made with your ancestors. Which way do you tend to look? Do you tend to look back and wish that everything could be the way it used to be? Or are you the sort of person who's always looking forward? Hopefully, or maybe not. Are you the person that sort of looks around you at everything that is going on and wonders how you're going to manage? Or do you often look within and in the words of the song, seek to find the hero inside yourself? 
Or is it a bit of all of those? See, when the people of Israel uh, were tempted to look back, they often wished they hadn't left Egypt at all. If they did actually look forward, all they saw were the problems that were going to face them. If they looked around them, all they saw was their lack. And if they looked within, it wasn't faith that they saw, but fear. Because the one direction in which they were not looking, the one direction in which they needed to look, and the direction in which all of us need to look and keep looking is up and to the Lord. Because when we look to the Lord, when we look back, we do so with thankfulness. When we look forward, we do so with confidence. When we look around, we do so knowing that He is with us. And when we look within, we find that peace of faith. Because we are always looking to the Lord. And that's why here in chapter 4, as Moses uh, begins another speech to the people, we're going to divide it into three sections and look at it over three weeks. The focus is all upon the Lord. Who is the Lord whom they worship? What is he like? What does he do? And Moses is going to say to them in verses 1 to 14, he is a generous God who gives so much. In the verses that we've read, he is the God who saves and also who is jealous. From verse 32 on, he alone is God. And so this morning we begin with the thought that within these verses that he is the God who saves. That lies at the heart of this particular passage. In verse 20 he says to them, As for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace, out of Egypt. It's the God who rescued you. A furnace is that place where metal is heated to such temperature that it begins to melt. So that all the impurities can be scraped off the top and we're left with pure metal. But if we sense at any point that our life is a bit like being in the furnace, that's not a pleasant place to be. The writer of the psalm says, Lord, we went through fire, we went through water. But then with confidence says, yet you have brought us out into a place of abundance. Moses describes the years in Egypt as a bit like a furnace. Not that it was always like that, of course. When the family first went down to see Joseph, and Joseph had that position of responsibility, the people were happy to welcome the family, to protect them, to bless them. But then, of course, Joseph died, and the Pharaoh died. Things began to change. And so it became like a furnace. And Moses uses that word to describe the cruelty that they suffered, to remind them of the hardship that they endured and the, the misery that they were kept in. But he says, remember always, the Lord brought you out of that. So don't look back and wish you could have those days again. Remember what they really were like. And remember how the Lord has brought you out of that. And for us too, there will be times when life will seem as if it's a bit like a furnace. And it may seem that the flames are very hot threaten to burn us or to destroy us. And in those moments, what we need above everything else is to know the Lord has not abandoned us. He hasn't given up on us. Actually, the Lord is right there with us. Remember the story of Daniel's three friends and the big statue that Nebuchadnezzar made of himself? And it was so big and tall, it wouldn't fit inside this building, despite the height of our ceiling. It was that big. And everybody was gathered in the city and they were told, I think it was when the trumpets were to sound, that everybody was to bow down. So the music sounded and everybody bowed down. Well, apart from Daniel's three friends. And if everybody else is kneeling on the pavement and you're standing, you stand out. 
<laughs> and it's obvious. They were threatened, they were tried to be persuaded to bow down, but they would not. So they threw them into a fiery furnace. One of them had been heated intensely. So intensely that as they were thrown in, the guards were knocked back by the fierce heat. But those flames didn't burn them. They certainly didn't destroy them. And as the people looked, there weren't three people, there were four people there. So now they're really confused. We sent three people in there, how come there are four? And it's what the theologians would call a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in human form before his incarnation. That is, there were moments when Christ would come and visit in this world and have a human form and be seen in a human form. But his incarnation is that time when he was born of the Virgin Mary and joined humanity to his deity in one person for all of eternity. But that story from Daniel tells us that in that most difficult place, the Lord doesn't abandon us, but he is with us. Now the reason that the Lord had brought them out of the furnace of Egypt is then stated in the second half of that verse. It's fantastic because that begins to complete the picture. He brought you out in order to make you his people. It wasn't just he felt sorry for you in your suffering, so he thought, I'm going to set you free. There was much more to it than that. He brought them out, yes, to set them free, and in order to make them his people. And the greatest privilege that we find within the scriptures is that God repeats that over and over again. I will be your God and you will be my people. In fact, that was the very purpose that God spoke to Moses back in Exodus. I will bring you out, I will set you free, I will redeem you. And we should say hallelujah to all three of those. But there's another one. I will take you as my people. And I will be your God. Just the privilege of that. For when Jeremiah talks of a new covenant... What is at the heart of the new covenant? They will know me. What were some of the last words of Jesus to his disciples before he was arrested and tried? As he began to pray, Lord, this is life, to know you, the only true God. And when you get to the end of Revelation, it's a, a bit like the end of a novel where uh, two people finally come together and you look at it and you think, at last. Because one of the last statements in the scriptures is, now the dwelling of God is with men and women. He is their God. And they're his people. And that's the heartbeat of God. Always has been and always will. It's the purpose of his creating us. It was the reason he brought Israel out of the smelting furnace of Egypt. And it's the reason why through the cross of Christ, he brings us out of sin and darkness in order that we may become his people. Those who trust him, who love him, who serve him, and those who show undivided loyalty to him. And that's the purpose of uh, the, the, the part within that section of chapter 4 that talks about not making idols of any shape or form. Because whatever shape or form the idol is, it's inadequate. How can an idol represent properly the glory and the majesty of God? Just can't do it. But secondly, idols are misleading. They give us wrong ideas about God. Because we might think that since an idol is limited to one place, God is limited to one place. Wrong. We might think that because with a little bit of effort we can pick an idol up and move it and put it somewhere else that we can move God around. Wrong. We might think that because they've got eyes they can see and they've got ears they can hear. Wrong, they can't. But the Lord is the one who truly sees and hears and knows and cares and understands and indeed carries us rather than us needing to pick up and carry him. And that's why 
Idols are not only inadequate and misleading, but they are forbidden. And that's linked with a, a statement about God, which uh, didn't come out quite so clearly in the Good News Bible. The Good News Bible says he does not tolerate any rivals. Now that's just one particular understanding of the word jealousy. God is a jealous God. And God even describes himself in that way. Surprised? A bit sort of, what are we supposed to make of that then? Because usually when we talk of the word jealous, it usually has a negative concept, doesn't it? You know, I'm jealous of somebody else because of what they've got or what they've achieved. And I wish that I had it or achieved it. And I don't like the fact that they have. Why should they and not me? Sometimes jealous may be a sense of being really rather suspicious of somebody else. Especially of a husband or a wife, you know. If you're suspicious of who they're talking to or who they're meeting. But that's not what we mean. God isn't jealous of anyone because God owns everything anyway. He's the creator of it all. What we own, we have for a few years until we die and then it's... We don't know what's going to happen to it, but God owns everything. So he's not jealous in that kind of way. He's not jealous in the sense of being suspicious because he knows everything that's going on in our thoughts and our hearts anyway. But there is a much more positive thought of this word jealousy, which is that within marriage, there can be a jealous guarding of what belongs between husband and wife. That is, that a couple will not allow anybody else into that marriage bond. Yes, we have friends. Yes, when children are born, they come into a family. But nobody is allowed into that relationship between husband and wife. We guard that jealously. And we are quite right to do so. And it is in that sense that God jealously guards the relationship that we have with him. It's a good thing. I don't know if you ever watch a program called Countdown, where people are given nine letters and they have to make the longest words they possibly can. And they have to do something similar with numbers. But somewhere in each program, one of the, uh, the sort of presenters of the show, she does this thing called Origin of Words. And it's really rather interesting to see where words have come from and how their meaning perhaps has changed. But this word jealous in our English language actually comes originally from an old French word, jalous. Or from a Latin word, zelosus, which means full of zeal. Now that's a different perspective on this word. And it comes from the old Greek zelos, which can mean both jealous, but also Zealous And zeal is having that passion, that devotion for something or someone. And so the jealousy of God is not just that he jealously guards the relationship that we have with him. But that he is zealous for us. That is that God is totally committed to us. And because God is so totally committed to us. That's why he calls us to be undivided in our loyalty and our worship. And so jealous is not a word for us to shy away from, to feel awkward over, but rather to try to understand correctly. It is fitting and it is right that we worship God. It actually fulfills the enjoyment that we have in God. And to worship God is something fully deserved. Deserved because he is so great. Deserved because he is so gracious. Deserved because he alone can rescue. And he alone can save. In which direction are you looking? Busy, can we sing as we close?